Hello. Um, welcome to our third episode of our Business Keeps On Dancing webinar. If you're listening, could you please let me know in the chat um, if you can hear me and let me know where you're listening from as well. Uh, I'm going to do a few shout outs to start off with as well. Um, oh, God, I'm um, so yeah, hi, Grace, we've got Lucas, Emma, Danny, Lauren, Anna, uh, who, who's joining us for the first time today? And who's been here for all three? Because you, you get a gold star if you've done for all three. <laughs> oh, wow, we've got people from Ireland, Italy, Barcelona, Grace. I'm, I'm streaming from, from sunny Liverpool. Uh, so thanks, thanks for joining us today. Um, and thanks to everyone who's who's been in touch. Based on your your feedback, a lot of people have say uh, have been saying that they would love to to carry on the conversation. And uh, you've been looking out for a lot of the links and the sources that we've referenced in the webinars. Um, so what what we've done today is launched a Facebook group, um, so we, we can house that conversation. We'll be really active in there, um, and then yeah, we we can chat to you all a bit further. So um, that there should be a link to the Facebook group in in the chat shortly. But the Facebook group is called Business Keeps On Dancing Community. Um, so if you head to Facebook, join the group, um, and then yeah, we, we can we can chat in more detail there later. Uh, we'd also like to know what what time works best for everyone on the webinar. So uh, we're going to post a poll in the chat as well um, with, with the best times that works for everyone. So I know everyone's got different working hours and everyone's in, in different time zones. So um, if you could uh, take the time out to fill in the poll as well, that'll be great, and we'll take that that feedback on board. Uh, so my name is Sean, I'm Head of Music and Events at Mustard Media. Um, we are a festival and events accelerator. Uh, so we created Business Keeps On Dancing to really bring together industry leaders and, and try and talk about how to, to build successful brands. Uh, and I've got the pleasure of, of hosting today's panel. Uh, so today we, we're going to give a warm welcome to Rashad Hassan Ali. He's the director at Ticket Arena and Fest Ticket. We've got Mark Newton, uh, who's the managing director at Hideout Festival. And we've also got Danny Nugent, who's the managing director at uh, Nuco Travel as well. So guys, can you just give me a quick hello just to check that we can, we can all hear you? Hello. Thanks. And have, have we got, I'm not too sure who that hello was from then. <laughs> that was Mark. Uh, Mark, okay, and, and Rashad and Danny, can can you hear us as well? Yeah, I can hear you, it's Danny. Nice one. Uh, th thanks, guys. So I'm just going to give everyone a bit bit more context into our topic for today, and then uh, and then we'll we'll hand over to our our speakers. So um, today's topic is all around uh, customer service, and and is that the channel? Is that the marketing channel that you didn't realise you? You had so I know often when when people mention customer service, it's it's not it's not the um, the jazziest of, of subjects, but we think it's really important right now for for many um, many events and many businesses who are about to or have already cancelled their their operations or their events. Customer service is actually a channel that you can use without even spending any extra budget to um, to retain your customers and build brand loyalty. So I think it's a really important one that we can dig deeper into. And today we've got um, we've got some business owners from, from a range of different industries that, that have been affected by this. So we've got um, the, the ski industry, we've got uh, the festival industry, and then and then ticketing and and on all the things around that. So I think we're going to get some nice perspectives of of um, of how different people have, have approached it, which I think you should all find really helpful. Um, and I think the way that, that the events and businesses react to, to these changes right now will actually have a big knock on effect for the future. Um, and great customer service can often be done without having to spend any extra budget. So by simply just, just trying to go the extra mile to provide that positive experience, it can, it can really uh, benefit your, your brand in the long run. So if you joined us for our previous two webinars, you'll know that we discussed loads of ideas around content and how to keep your uh, channel really engaging, how to think ahead of the curve and, and really jump onto new trends quite quite quickly. Um, and really relating to how your audience feels right now was, was a lot of those takeaways. But what we want to think about this week is how will the engagement on your page look if you've got 500 angry customers in the background who are very likely to, to voice their opinion on your on your social channels. So as as we all know, it can take it can take months as well as thousands of pounds of, of budget to, to find a customer, but it only takes seconds to lose one. So how can you use your customer service to create brand loyalty? 
Uh, recent survey data from, from Edelman revealed that 65% of consumers said uh, a brand's crisis response today will influence their likelihood of purchasing from that brand in future. And on average, loyal customers can be worth up to 10 times more as their first purchase. And this really goes to show that customer loyalty and retention are really big contributors to when it comes to guaranteeing the endurance of your business. So this poses the question, is there now an opportunity to stand out from your competition through your customer service? Because we're all in the same position. We all need to get our, um, you know, keep our customers uh, retained, but also, you know, when we come around to relaunching or whenever business picks back up again, everyone's going to be in the same position and there's going to be a lot of competition. So can you use your customer service as a chance to stand out from, from what your competitors are doing? And this is something to really think about for anyone who may have to deal with cancellations or have got this coming up. So I think you'll, you'll find this really useful today. So the good news is that many businesses should already have a customer service system in place and whether this is a team of 10, 100 or simply one person who just monitors your, your emails and, and your social pages, um, most people have got this in place. So how can you use those channels as a marketing tool to actually create a positive experience for your customers? One thing is that that, that is really notable right now is that we need to be really resourceful and no one's got budget to do these crazy marketing campaigns. No one really wants to see crazy marketing campaigns right now. I think people just want to, you know, relate to how people are feeling right now. But if you can use your customer service to be uh, in a resourceful way um, to, to, to get your customers on board with your brand, an increase of just 5%, let's say, in customer loyalty could lead to an increase of, of up to 25% or 100% increase in, in profit per customer. So you can, in fact, increase your future revenue by simply delivering amazing customer service. And that's without having to spend a penny on, on marketing, which is great. Um, I've actually got a really good story to, to back this up. I, I hope um, I hope she's tuning in today. So Lisa, who, who works with us at Mustard Media, um, Lisa went to Worldwide Festival many, many years ago. She absolutely loved the vibe. Uh, There's a real personal touch to the festival. So she returned again where she met her partner, Matt, so the, the, the next year they returned again and they actually got engaged at the festival. Uh, they were part of, of a worldwide Facebook group. Everyone was posting in there. Uh, the owners were in there and, and all, many of the customers knew, knew the owners by the first name as well. Uh, so Lisa sent in their engagement story to, to worldwide on, on social media and won free tickets the following year. But she didn't only win free tickets, the owner got in touch and sorted them out with a big party, uh, champagne. He turned up at their, uh, their apartment one morning to, to invite them to be in the after movie, uh, which I thought was, was just a great touch. So since then, um, Matt and Lisa have got married, they've, they've had a gorgeous little baby and the festival owner still stays in touch with them and comments on, on all of the, the family photos and the baby photos and stuff. Um, and I think small personal touches such as that really live long in the memory. And, and just that one example has built great brand loyalty as Lisa and Matt even returned there the following year for their honeymoon. So it's kind of gone, gone full circle. Um, and I imagine that festival doesn't have the, the, the biggest of budgets or the biggest team. It's very much family run, but they've still managed to create exceptional customer service through that, that experience. And there's, there's a great book by Chip Heath and Dan Heath called The Power of Moments. And that talks a lot about how extraordinary moments can have a lasting impact. And a moments are, are pretty much meaningful experiences that, that stand out in our memory. And Lisa's moment with, with Worldwide, that's even stuck it in my memory and I didn't even go through it. Um, and we, you know, we don't really remember what we had for dinner last week, but what we do remember is, is moments. And uh, from reading the book, we we love this idea so much that we actually made it our, our mission at Mustard Media. So our mission is to engineer exceptional moments, no matter what we do. So whether that's with our client work and we're filming crazy launch videos or whether that's with our internal team. So for my five year anniversary, which I, I didn't even realize it was, uh, I walked into a surprise party. We had cake, we had Prosecco, we had loads of Liverpool songs blasting. It, it was great. Um, but that's that's what people remember and that's what I remember. Like I, I don't remember what emails I sent that, that day. I don't remember what I did the day before or the day after. Like I just remembered that moment because it, it really um it really made the connection in some way. So to bring this back to customer service, uh, in the book, a study of service encounters asked customers to recall their recent satisfying or dissatisfying interactions with employees. And 25% of those positive encounters reported 
but actually employees' responses to service failures. So when employees actually handled the, the situation well, they transformed, uh, transformed a negative into a positive. And I think the main takeaway from that is that to master customer service, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have these crazy teams and these crazy systems. Um, it's just about doing the little things right. Um, and, and a big takeaway from, um, from this particular study was that businesses who can spot the customer's moments of, of dissatisfaction, which is pretty likely to happen in, in coming weeks, there's, there's many factors that are out of, of businesses' control um, with, with cancelling events and, and postponing your operations. But the ones who really take decisive action they're the ones who are able to differentiate themselves from um from the comp from their com competitors so just just by simply offering to help someone in a difficult time which you know is a goal and reward on its own it's, it's nice to help people that also has it as a good side effect on on being great for business and brand loyalty so that's just a short snippet from the book i, I definitely recommend adding it to your reading list and we can we can send some some links to it in the facebook group later on um, but I think one one problem is that when when many people think of, of customer service, they think of these expensive CRM systems and huge call centers and thousands of emails. However, amazing customer service can be done by teams of, of any size just with the right application. So the question is, how can you make your customers remember a positive experience through your customer service? And the power of moments actually um, speaks about different types of moments and I'll, I'll let you read the book but one of those moments that's relevant I, I think to customer service is um, elevation so moments of elevation are ones that rise above the routine it's it's outside of the ordinary you kind of expect to go into a shop and you don't really expect the greatest service but how can you break the script with your customer service and it's something they speak a lot about in the book and um, breaking the script is basically defying what people would expect from from your brand so if you are uh, if you do have to let your customers know that your uh, event can't take place or you can't deliver what service you'd usually deliver how can you actually break the script and kind of um kind of go over and above of what the, of what their expectation is of, of, of how you would handle that and i think doing those uh, creating those moments will actually live long in, in the customer's memory they're likely to tell the friends the the dog the nan and anyone they know about it because i think anyone who's had great service is is quite likely to shout about it it could even go viral depending on on, on how crazy uh, you can go with it but um yeah the main takeaway is that you want to really try and break the script with, with what you're doing so people can remember it and it'll make your brand stand out um, so that, that's just a bit of insight into today's topic. Uh, we'll have loads of links to, to send you uh, later on. Um, but today we welcome our panel of industry experts who I'm, I'm really excited to chat to today. And we should get some, some really interesting insight from our panel today as they've all got experience in, in different industries. Um, they all run their own businesses and they're all facing um, similar challenges to, to many of you who are tuning in today who might have had your, your operations cancelled. So, um, so yeah, let, let's jump into it and speak to our first speaker today. So we've got Rashad, uh, who's from Ticket Arena and Fest Ticket. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today, Rashad. How's it going? Yeah, not too bad. Okay, so. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too bad. It's actually looking pretty sunny here today. So <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's quite good working from home. Uh, so it's great to get you on today. Th thanks for taking the time out. And it's really interesting to get your uh, perspective from, from a ticketing agency. Um, so to give to give a bit of background into you, uh, you founded Event Genius and Ticket Arena, who have collectively served more than 4.5 million customers from over 120 countries. Uh, and you recently joined forces with Fest Ticket to create an end-to-end -end platform for both organisers and fans. So I think one thing in particular um, that you'll have insight into is that you work with festivals and, and event partners all, all around the world. And I imagine your team has been working very closely with, with many of the different affected promoters who, who really need help at this time to reassure their, their customers. And as a result of that, you will have been fortunate to, to gain quite unique insights and, and the best practices being used across across the whole of the events industry. So what have been the main takeaways and some of the best practices that you've been giving to your event organizers or things that you've seen um, for people to follow with their customer service? 
Yeah, so I guess um, for us, we, we've got two two customers, as you pointed out. We've got the event organizer, which is one of our customers, and we've also got the end consumer as well. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, for us, it's it's been you know communication is a key a key part of uh, of this whole process, really. Um, by being by you know, having constant communication with the fans, being honest with them, um, making them feel part of the event and getting their support really sort of helps you then decide on whether, you know, how you're going to move the event or how if you can cancel, um, you know, especially if you're going to move the event, are people going to retain uh, their tickets? And, and by, by being upfront and honest and things like that, then I think that's where you sort of see um, you see be better retention rates because I know obviously some festivals have already, uh, you know, spent a large amount of the budget, um, and you know having to refund all customers isn't quite ideal. So, um, yeah, I think we've seen you know really good communication from customers, um, making sure that the, the festival organisers and people like us are always in constant communication before any statements or press releases or anything like that making sure that we've all got the same plan of action and that our customer service team is lined up um because through event genius and obviously through through um the white label side of things you know we we're very much the promoters in-house customer service team um for our contracts so it's important that um we're all on the same page because you know say one wrong thing then it could just blow out of, of, of um you know comes to, <laughs> to deal with basically so um yeah we, we've been working really hard with the promoters um setting up things like faqs on their websites um not just communicating through social because a lot of people will go back to the original website as well so it's important to make sure that you replicate the information there um you know obviously working with an agent you trust um it's got decent customer service definitely helps i mean we're averaging about two and a half hour response times at the moment which is you know really sort of cutting down a lot on on um potential issues we're quite proactive as well so we're sending out information ahead of time so um we're again getting a bit less in you know inbounds of what we you know by being proactive um and you know by by having sort of the best uh, communication with customers and sort of having that that real sort of you know one to one in you know communication with customers um you know you're able to then like i said ease off maybe some of the thing pressures that you might be getting from like chargebacks and refund requests and things like that because obviously if people start you know you, you move your event and a lot of uh, refund requests happen or chargebacks and it becomes more expensive to deal with and also a lot more money and potentially making the new date not sustainable basically um so yes yeah, so i think that that's probably some of those key things um to take away from that nice and and from your insight what have been um the best success stories from from event organizers who have maintained great customer service during this time and can you give us an overview um you don't need to go into too much detail but can you give us an overview of how they've approached it yeah, I think um, I probably like I, I think like I said, some of the festival organisers who've really done well is um, by having sort of a bit of a heartfelt message back to their fans of explaining exactly what's going on, being really transparent, uh, explaining to them. Yes, you know, fans may might not understand how the industry work and um, you know how much effort goes into planning and putting on a show and, and things like that basically and what the ins and outs are so by by being really upfront and transparent and explaining to, to fans you know how everything works um, then you kind of get the best reaction because fans just realize okay it's not that easy just to press refund and not get the refund basically there, there's quite a lot of hoops that we have to jump through and processes and different suppliers and all this sort of stuff that that you have to do so um I and mean, one of the, the, the great success stories we had was we worked really closely with southport weekend um and considering their festivals are really high ticket price because it's a ticket and it's accommodation as well so i think around the three four hundred pounds per person um they tried to obviously reschedule it for this year but they couldn't get a date so they rescheduled it to next year um 
but by having the right communication with their fans and really explaining them what they're going through and also having like a, a we, de- we basically for a number of festivals we've set up dedicated FAQ pages and support pages basically so it's not just generic um it sort of um you know meant that they've got i think one charge back and about a handful of refund requests and that's you know the event was out back in march so the new event in March next year and then their social media was really really positive um and um you know considering how expensive the ticket price is i think that they really worked in they executed it really well amongst other promoters as well but that was one that, that's probably stood yeah. out a lot basically due to the high ticket price yeah that, i think that's a great result and yeah. on the flip side is there anything that um people should avoid with, with the cancellation responses yeah i think um certainly going out like i said going out of a press release without talking to the TV agent um it is is definitely a no-no uh, because I'll, no one likes the element of surprise it means that you've got you know especially at this time when there's a lot of customer service um you know you don't want your brand to get affected and therefore you know if, if, you're, if you're taking if you've got a plan together then then great um i think you know by being too quiet could obviously affect people when they start to get nervous. Um, you know, making sure that you don't plan a new day when it might still be impacted. So I know a lot of festivals are going for September, um, some potentially August. August might be too early, we don't know yet. Um, so yeah, making sure that whenever you set the new day, it, it's the right time for, for that new date, basically. And otherwise, we're going to have to deal with another <laughs> another postponement and more customer service, and it's just not going to look very good on the brand, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like I said, if you if you've got you know if you've got a lot of inbounds, try not to do the the customer service yourself. If you especially if you've got an agreement with the with the agent that they're going to handle the customer service on your behalf, because um, otherwise, what you end up you could have conflicting statements. And, you know, you all need to be on the same page. So, you know, that, that, I think that that's really important as well. Yeah, definitely. And uh, recently, you launched the flex ticket um, mm-hmm. option, so that allows festival goers with with more flexible cancellation um, on tickets or package bookings before the end of April. Because the reality for a lot of promoters is that if their event has been cancelled and it's later in the year, you know, to, to survive, they they do need to um still push tickets but it, it's given people um what uh, what you've just mentioned you don't want to push tickets and then it's cancelled and then everyone's kind of really unsure of, of what the process is after that but if if you can create this really flexible system where it's kind of um it's so easy for the customer to buy a ticket but they'll they'll know um they've got the kind of safety net of um flexible cancellations afterwards how effective is that being for for different organizers to really maintain this clear transparent positive experience for customers in case events do cancel yeah, so we, we, we've signed up over 100 partners so far. Um, we've seen around a 35% uplift in sales um, from when it obviously the market crashed, I suppose, um, so to say. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, we, what we're doing as well at the moment is we're now um, potentially, well, we're probably like 90% sure that we're now going to extend that period for another two months. So it was due to finish at the end of April. And we're now going to um, add another two months to it. And what we're, you know, the whole post, the whole point of the flex ticket is to give those customers, like you said, peace of mind to book. Um, and they can just literally email us and say, or, or contact us and say that, look, I don't want to turn up to the event anymore because I don't feel safe with the coronavirus. Or for whatever reason, they can get a refund. And I think that was, the, it's never sort of been done before in that sort of process um, in the event industry. And I think we needed to have something that was, that drastic that yes the customer can get a refund for whatever reason in order to make it really clear because otherwise if you start introducing barriers and you know different terms of conditions around around it it has doesn't have the same impact the same effect for the customer's booking so i think you know most promoters are, are, are you know, I'm bored because obviously they're right now, but you know, the sales are next to nothing. So, um, so yeah, so it was important to do that. We're amending the website to, to be more prominent. So we've made changes already on, on box offices and, and, and uh, our checkouts and stuff like that to entice people and to explain them what it is. Um, but yeah, we're keeping, we're adding more parts to it as well. Basically. That sounds great. If, if you've got any more, more links and information on that, send that over to us and we can share that with everyone. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in the group later on. 
yeah. and then as I mentioned before your your customer service is, is kind of two prongs you've got your ticket buyers and then you've got your event organizers so how have um, Fest Ticket and Ticket Arena tried to go that extra mile in your customer service for your clients to try and make, make sure they maintain their loyalty to your platform as well with your with your support yeah, so I guess for, for customers, we've tried to, with events that have been postponed or cancelled or um, scheduled, etc. Um, you know, we, we've tried to, to work with the event organisers in order to be able to offer vouchers in some cases. Um, for our cash system, for example, we've, we've allowed people, um, we can offer people drinks credits or food credits and stuff like that when they go to the festival. Um, We've, you know, we've tried to to offer things like that. Obviously, the flex ticket, what we just discussed about. Um, we're trying to also introduce new sort of content as well and diversifying um, the experience. So um, we're trying to to now launch more sort of um, media online. Um, so things like live streams and different different ways of entertaining our, our customer base um, and you know sort of keeping them um, sane in this <laughs> in this period basically um, so yeah and, and also you know like I said with the customer service element um, you know we, I think we're, we've got about 90 percent plus uh, customer success rating on uh, over 30,000 reviews we're responding them really quickly and, and the fact is you know the reviews aren't being affected as badly so that means we're doing you know the customers are are not voicing anything that, that they're you know that's the first line where someone tends to to voice their concern or their issues. Um, so I think that was um, I, th I think it shows that we so far we're, we're doing a pretty decent job on on the customer side of things. Um, on the organizer side of things, um, you know we're, we're making sure that, like I said, that we're always responding with the customer with the organizers, working really closely with them, amending press releases, um, coming up with flexible ways of trying to. Um, you know, keep their, their, their ticket sales, you know, the ones that want to reschedule and want to keep as many people engaged um, and not ask for refunds. You know, we will try to come up with different plans with them, different ideas. Um, and I think um, what, what we've managed to do as well is, is speak to think people like the payment gateways. Um, so um, Different countries at the moment are launching different laws and different initiatives. So Germany have introduced like a credit voucher system. Um, Portugal have said um, that the government have said uh, if you reschedule within a year, you might you, then you don't have to offer refunds. And it's all unfortunately all the all the different new initiatives are still very new and you know they they tend to the payment gateways almost haven't caught up fully with them and they obviously been you know there's a lot of inbound everywhere so we've engaged a legal team and and we you know we're in constant conversation with our, our payment gateway to say look you know with this initiative in this country then you know we don't want to see chargebacks for this because this is the you know this is what the government has passed um, and you know, or in Portugal or, or whatever country it is, and I think promoters are really appreciating the fact that we're we're trying to you know fight their corner, I suppose, so to speak. And with you know, we we don't want to. Um, I suppose we, we we need to be careful as well because we need to make sure the customer doesn't get upset because at the end of the day, they're our end consumer; they're the ones funding these projects. But it's also trying to you know make sure that we don't um, you know sort of destroy the industry i suppose unnecessarily so that that's been a real help um and we're you know we're continuing on making deals for for, for, for next year um we're continuing to add a lot of new functionality especially through our event genius platform um where we, we, were, at, we were getting ready basically for the bounce back um and we're, we're, we're trying to look at new revenue streams as well that, that can work for promoters especially in these conditions Great. So it sounds like you've been so proactive on both sides to really keep um, both your customers and your your organisers happy as well. Um, yeah. so th thanks so much for sharing us with that that insight, Rashad. Uh, we're going to go over to Mark next uh, from Hideout. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today, Mark. How's it going on your end? Good. Keeping busy. Um, still lots of work to do, even though sort of the world has come to a standstill. Um, but yeah, just kind of moving on as positively as we, we can in the situation and then just sort of fingers crossed that we get out of this and things go back to normal as quickly as possible, really. Yeah. 
And to give you a quick intro to, to everyone who's tuned in today, uh, you're a director at Hideout Festival and Hideout is a five day festival in Croatia and it's got everything from beach parties to boat parties to pool parties and it's all across these five open air venues. It's great. I, I was there for the very first year actually and I've been several times since and there's such a great vibe to the festival. Um, and Hideout was actually about to celebrate its 10th anniversary um, which is, is amazing. Unfortunately the, the celebrations will have to wait a little bit longer but 10 years in the festival business can only be in that you're doing something right and you've yeah. built up <laughs> <You're> Hopefully. Really... <laughs> and you've really built up a loyal following over the past decade um so really sorry to hear that you've you've had to cancel for for 2020 um i'm sure the team has, has kind of been putting so much effort into to making an event happen and um it can be a blow to, to hear that type of news but your your cancellation statement last week was received with a really positive response uh, online from, from what I could see and and you didn't only offer the customers who who, who, um, who did buy tickets for 2020 a refund uh, what you did was also offer uh, those who are, who are willing to stick with you really support the brand um, and, and transfer to next year you've offered them uh, beach party tickets and boat party tickets as well which I thought was a really nice touch and for those loyal fans who, who are going to stick by you I think it's just great to incentivize them in that way um, so I'd love to hear a bit more about um, how you kind of put this cancellation response together and what the key factors were when you were putting this together yeah so hideout's quite a tricky festival with regards to the fact that it's uh, a festival that takes place in croatia but the majority of our audience are based in the uk mm. so we were very much sort of torn between like how we would decide which sort of not necessarily government um sort of regulations are in place but what how would customers feel in one if the if it went ahead in croatia because things were okay in the uk how would the croatian people feel about that and vice versa mm. so it wasn't as simple of us sort of waiting to get a date when events can large-scale gatherings can happen again and then just planning and going with that date it was very much sort of weighing things up as to whether or not we thought it was likely that both Croatia and the UK would be back to normal at the same time and be ready to have large scale gatherings. Um, so we were actively monitoring what was happening in uh, Croatia uh, with our contacts over there and consulting the government website over there, obviously um, monitoring everything in the UK as well. Um, it was It was quite a hard decision to make because it became quite apparent early on that there wouldn't be anything sort of put in place for the end of June that meant the festival would definitely stop. Um, there'd be no deadlines put in place saying we can't do mass gatherings until this point. Uh, all the airlines were saying at the minute flights are only cancelled until the middle of June where like Jet2 was saying they were planning to start their holidays again from the 17th of June. Various other airlines have been saying similar things. So for us, it was more taking a proactive and sensible approach as to did we think that it was a, a good idea as festival organisers to go ahead with this festival at that time? Where did we think the position would be in both countries at that time? And what did we think that our customers would want as well? And we were in a bit of a tricky situation that um, we don't just sell the festival ticket. We sell flights, we sell accommodation, we sell airport transfers. So we've got a lot of different stakeholders and partners in the business that we had to sort of consult with as well. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of deposits out with accommodation owners, a lot of deposits out with airlines for flights. So it was very much sort of taking an approach where we spoke to all the different um, stakeholders whilst trying to keep our customers as happy as possible. Um, we ended up putting a holding statement out about a week before the actual cancellation statement itself because we were monitoring all our um, customer service queries. We were sort of monitoring were they positive, negative or neutral, uh, how many were coming in a day, where they were coming in from, were they coming in across the phone, were they coming in across social media. Um, and it got to the point where we knew we weren't going to be able to make a decision, but we felt that it escalated with customers to, to a point where we should give them something to kind of put their minds at rest as much as possible without giving anyone false hope in one direction or the other. Mm. Um, so we put the holding statement out, which was received really well. 
it was sort of a mixed bag with how people reacted. Uh, some people were like, please don't cancel the festival. It's the only thing we've got to look forward to in lockdown. And then other people were like, do you really think by the end of June that this is going to happen? Glastonbury's already cancelled. Uh, we think you should cancel it. So it was interesting to see like the positive and the negative re responses from people. Mm -hmm. um, and that just allowed us to have a little bit more time to speak with everyone, make an informed decision, speak to all the artists that were going to be performing, speaking to our accommodation providers, all the airlines, chatting to everyone involved in the festival and saying, look, we feel that we're not going to be able to deliver the festival that we want to deliver, especially with it being the 10th anniversary. Uh, even if we could go ahead, um, we were like, there'll be people that will be concerned about traveling abroad. There'll be um, suppliers that won't be able to come and work with us. And we just felt that it was really um, sensible just to go, you know what, we're going to not another thing sorry i forgot to mention is we also weighed up whether we should postpone it into fur further into the season yeah um but again the decision on that was if things got back to normal at the end of august and we postponed till september how much pressure would there be on the resort itself from uh standard holiday makers and also on the airlines as to how much would flights cost if everything goes back to normal in august the demand for flights from families, from couples, from everyone will want to be going on holiday. Um, and if it then meant that our flights for customers have gone up to six, seven hundred pounds, it's not fair on the customer having to pay that level of uh, fee to get there. Yeah. So we just decided after speaking to everyone, the most sensible approach was to cancel the festival, uh, get the dates out for the following year at the same time, uh, offer everyone a refund, if, uh, if they wanted a refund, but then also to incentivize them uh, if they did want to stay and come the following year. A lot of people were looking forward to it. A lot of people have wrote off their summer holidays already, so they probably won't be going abroad this year. So for us, we were like, look, if we want people to stay on board, we want to offer them above and beyond what they will be expecting. And I think what you mentioned earlier was really interesting about remembering those experiences. And for our customers, um, the beach party and the boat parties are part of the festival that is sort of, it's where all the, the Instagrammable moments come from. Whenever you see anyone's feed about coming to hideout, it's yeah. always sort of out at sea, on the beach, dancing. So we were, we just thought, look, we'll give them some added value. And in turn, they're helping us by helping our cash flow. Yeah. So when we put the statement out there, we're like, look, it will really help us if you do roll into next year. Um, the, this is what we'll do if you do want to come next year and sort of give them the added benefits at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I think it sounds like throughout your whole approach, it's being customer centric, but you can't jump the gun and just do what all of the customers are asking in the comments. Yeah. Step yeah back, look at the wider picture, and then you've actually because, worked up the best for them. Yeah. We, we were very aware that we didn't want to say one thing and then it sort of come back against us a month later. Um, yeah. We just wanted to wait until we could make a clear decision, whether that was a decision influenced by government policy or not. It needed to feel like it came from from us as a company and we felt comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, and how have you been monitoring whether this has been a positive response? Because the socials look great. Everything what you've said looks great. How have you actually been monitoring whether this has been a success as, as much as it can be? Um, well, I think uh, a couple of factors. Uh, the first way has been we had the tracker for customer responses anyway. So we were monitoring how many responses we get in a day. Uh, were they positive? Were they negative? Were they neutral? Were they after information? What information were, were, they, were they contacting us about? Um, we're also very fortunate that we have a customer service team on the phone because we sell packages and they're quite sort of complicated products. We have a team that answer the phone. So although some of our customer service staff have been furloughed and some of our marketing staff have been furloughed, we left enough people working so that they could answer queries on the phone and sort of, it's a lot easier when you're having that one-on-one -on -one interaction with people to Put their minds at rest and sort of explain a lot of what we were doing so i think monitoring uh how customers were, be were behaving and um seeing the sort of improvement from maybe having 30 negative comments and 30 negative emails a day going down to 20 going down to 10 going down to zero and i think that was one of the positives and then the second positive has been with uh 
tracking refunds versus um, people that are prepared to move their ticket into next year. Yeah. Uh, the first day we got a big spike of refunds, which we were expecting because a lot of people are in sort of quite tricky circumstances at the minute. And uh, we expected people to sort of come and ask for money if they need it. So we, um, we, we monitored that, but then now it's started to steady down and we are seeing a, now more people sort of coming and saying, yes, I want to keep the ticket um, with that. People are like really appreciative that they have the benefits as well. So uh, I think it's just monitoring that situation throughout really. Yeah. And imagine everything's changing every day, but really kind of the way you've kept on top of that, I think it's, as you said, it's kind of brought it down gradually. To yeah, it. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and do you think this, this whole experience, now you've mentioned that a lot of people are, are up for coming again next year, but do you think the way you've approached this has actually been a big factor in, in what will help you uh, hopefully retain customers for 2021? Yeah, I think so. Um, like I said, the call centre uh, is it, great for us because you actually get that one-on-one -on -one chat experience. Like yeah. It's pretty old school in the way we do it, but we also feel that people like a friendly voice on the end of the phone and yeah. people will ring up irate and after 30 seconds on the phone when they know that they're speaking to another human and they're not typing on the keyboard, <laughs> shouting and swearing. Like, it just becomes a lot more personable. And yeah. like, when I obviously not now because we're all working from home, but when I used to sit in the office and we'd get complaints in, seeing how quickly people would change on the phone when they were ringing up and speaking to someone, like, I think that that goes a long way to building relationship with customers. And I think especially when you've got a brand that's been there for 10 years and to a lot of people, like you look at our social media stats and like there's 200 plus thousand people that follow us on Instagram. Like we, we, we've, we can come across, not faceless on purpose, but you automatically think when the business is sort of operating at a certain level, they've not got a regard from the customer. Whereas once they chat to someone that is part of that organization and it's not just this big brand at the top of it, people feel a lot more comfortable and like develop a relationship. And like, I know like some of the customers now that we've been selling packages to, they ring the office and they're on like a, a, a first name basis with the call center <laughs> team, chatting about what they've been up to. And it, it's, it's kind of nice having that experience for people as well. Yeah, I love that. It makes it makes such a big difference. And as as Rashad touched on earlier, um, what a lot of people don't understand if, if they're not in the industry is that there's so many factors to consider. And if they want the brand that they love to continue, the brand has to stay, take a step back and think of these things. But a lot of it you can't really put on social media that you are kind of trying to deal with all these suppliers in the background. But a phone call, you can actually say, listen, this is where we're at. I would love you to join next year and kind of explain the concept. Yeah situation yeah and, and also we've been the really lucky situation that we've been able to give refunds and mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of people out there that are, are, are stuck financially because they've outlaid a lot of their ticket funds already and the difference between refunding versus like postponing and not being able to give a refund is the survival of their company the survival of their event the survival for a lot of people's favorite events as well and when you put that into people into context with people um a lot of people change their opinions. It's like, what's yeah. worth more to you? Your £100 ticket rolling into next year or your festival that you love going to never happening again. Yeah. And although that like, we've had a very po a positive experience and we've been able to give people refunds, it's totally understandable when people can't do it as well. Yeah, totally. And and do you find um, most years you, you have many return customers year on year at Heidel because you've kind of you've built up that, that rapport with everyone over the past 10 years? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange one with Hideout. Like, we, we have a good base of return customer year on year, but then it kind of seems like people come as a rite of passage, like between like 18 and 21, sort of like the first time people go to Ibiza as well. Yeah. And then they dip off for a couple of years, and then you see people that come back, and like, oh, I came here five years ago, this has changed, that's changed. That was me. We, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> It's quite, it's quite funny as well. Joe, who's uh, our sales manager, he came to the first hideout as well. So he's he's got a lot of um, personal experience about about talking to people about how the festival works, how it's evolved and everything. And like, I think all our customer service team have had such a good time and so much fun at the festival um, that everyone has, knows the product inside out so they can, can mm. speak very encouragingly about it as well. Mm. That's really interesting. Thank you so much for that, Mark. Uh, we're going to move over to Danny now.
Uh, so Danny, thank you for taking the time uh, to join us today. I know you've you've been really busy on, on your side. How's everything going? Uh, yeah, well now actually we we're, we're sort of through our busy period due to the nature of our business, um, but starting to plan for next season now. Nice. And to give to give you a quick intro uh, for everyone who's tuning in, um, you founded Nuco seven years ago, and you've you've built it up to be the UK's leading university snow sports specialist. So um, you're responsible for taking lo loads of students to uh, across loads of different resorts on their ski trip. So um, it's really great to get you on today because I think your experience as, as a ski trip operator is, um, has probably brought it around its own challenges in itself. And I think uh, many many industries are are facing uncharted territory and, and challenges that we've not come across before. Um, but few have been hit as hard as the travel industry. And this this whole um, incident has, has kind of come, come around at a time when ski seasons were actually already underway. So in a way that you've actually had to react the quickest out, out of everyone. So how did, this, how did this affect your trips and how did you approach your response to that? Um, it's affected the, the back end of our season, so it's affected around 6,000 of our, our passengers um, that were booked to travel in March and April. Um, and we take people to France, Italy and Andorra, and they've, they've fallen into two categories. Um, the majority of them fall into the category similar to what Mark was just mentioning, where their, their trip's just been cancelled in advance. Um, but then we've had some people that have fallen into um, the pool of where they've trips been curtailed. So essentially they've been on holiday en route to resort. And once they've gotten to resort, um, the, the trips had to end because the authorities have changed the advice on that day. Mm. Um, I mean, in the background, that, that was actually on the weekend when this all kicked off in France. On Friday, March the 13th, the resorts assured us that they were all going to be open for another week. Um, so we sent our customers out there. And then on Saturday, March the 14th, as they were arriving after a long day of traveling, um, they were told, unfortunately, all shops and businesses are closing and the ski slopes are closing. Uh, so you need to go home again. Crazy. <laughs> and how, how did you um how did you even begin to, to think about how to res respond to that and how did you put your, your response together uh with the large number of passengers that were affected um we knew we would get overwhelmed um, unless we were proactive as possible with our communication um on the weekend in question we benefited from almost our entire team many of which voluntarily working long hours over the weekend to offer 24 hour support um, to the customers. Um, we prioritized those people that were on holiday, so the people that got curtailed, yeah. um, over and above those that were getting their trips canceled. Yeah. Um, and then the people that got their trips canceled, we worked in date order, so the people that were set to travel next got dealt with next, and so on and so on. So for the passengers that were out in resort, which was around about a thousand, and we kept them updated with email and push notifications of the status of their resort and what was going to be happening with um, their accommodation. And we arranged rescue transfers um, for all of them to get back to Geneva Airport or back to um, the various airports that we use. Uh, we then just offered assistance and support around the clock, really, and um, via live chat and telephone, 24 hours for people to get home. And our last customers got home on the Tuesday. Wow. Um, for the passengers that were yet to travel, um, so there's about 5,000 of them, um, as quickly as possible we confirmed to them that we intended to refund and that they didn't need to worry. And um, We advised them of the time frame that they could expect that refund in. Yeah. Um, and we did all of this communication within 24 hours. And I think critically the last point um, meant that the majority of affected people so those that were cancelled and hadn't started to travel were well informed. That hugely reduced the number of inquiries we were getting from that portion of our customers, which enabled us to focus our efforts on the thousand people that needed to get home. Mm. <laughs> so by acting fast, you've actually been able to reduce the total number of, of requests coming in and then that's allowed you to focus on maybe people who didn't need it as, as urgently. Yeah, I think so, yeah. 
yeah that's great and how um it sounds like uh by the way that you've reacted to that um i can imagine that's had a positive response because you, you've been so quick and honest and you've really kind of gone the extra mile to, to help everyone out who, who was on resort how have you tried to monitor that that was a positive response um i mean it's, i think most i'd like to say most people are happy we don't have um, specific stats for everyone um, but the direct feedback we've received from customers um, has shown that they've appreciated our support we've had a host of um, positive online reviews um, I think our ability to respond to inquiries quickly purely based on the fact we had less people contacting us because they knew what was going on meant yeah. that we could service those incoming inquiries um, in more detail and offer them more time yeah. Um, so it just resulted in the vast majority of people, you know, giving us positive reactions. I mean, like everyone, there's there's obviously some people that aren't um, aren't happy. Everyone has some unhappy customers, but the aim is to get as many of them happy as possible. Yeah, yeah. It, it, what I mentioned earlier with the uh, the the service encounter study and uh, great customer service can actually come from when people have had a negative experience and by you turning that round into positive, that's what they'll actually remember. So I'm sure there's plenty of opportunity for, for people to do that in, in the coming weeks. And I think Mark Mark touched on it briefly before, but as, as a package provider, you'll work with many different suppliers and other operators as well. So did that provide a different set of challenges with your customer service, having to liaise with the um, other different suppliers as well? Um, it provided some challenges for those that were in resort. Um, there was no set rule, for example, as to when um, the passengers that were in France had to leave their accommodation. Mm. And all of the local um, accommodation staff, such as the receptionists, were saying different things to different passengers that the lockdown starts soon, you're going to be quarantined in France if you don't leave today. Mm. Um, so it was, it was sort of managing that across it was around eight different resorts and 20 different residences and making sure that the passengers had the correct information and not just hearsay. Yeah. Um, our customer service team works um, in close conjunction with our ops team, so we manage that um, flow of information relatively well. Yeah, and I imagine that there's many different um, other ski operators and university trip operators out there. Do you think the way that you've, you've approached this in such a, a fast and efficient way has helped you to, to differentiate from your competitors and almost be used as, as, a, as a unique selling point for your brand? I think ever since we were founded, we've, we've done whatever we can to ensure that customer service is a big focus. Mm. Um, I mean, we do sell the majority of our holidays to students, so our, the budgets are fairly low. I mean, we're not John Lewis, um, but we do we do do everything we can to have a really good quality customer service yeah um we were founded with student groups at the core and through good customer service we've been able to transition a lot of them to travel with us as graduates and young professionals and, right. and to be honest that's been when we founded it we didn't expect that portion of the our market to account for 20 percent of our business and that's the area where we can grow so yeah i think it's been essential to our growth Great. And and your recent social campaign promoted a really positive outlook. So you were you were reaching out to your audience to really um, ride the storm, look forward to better times and, and hopefully you, you'll all be back soon. Um, it's an interesting thought that your customer service can actually impact your your wider marketing. And I, t I touched on it earlier on uh, with the thought that, you know, you can throw throw yourself into loads, loads of great content to, to keep your your channels engaged. But if you're not dealing with the customers in the background, your wider marketing efforts are actually going to be effective by that so was it important to, to keep those two working together with your customer service and, and your wider marketing yeah it was essential i think had we not had the approach to customer service and the coronavirus that we did um we wouldn't have been able to really put any posts up on our socials yeah the right the storm campaign campaign was just to demonstrate um industry-wide solidarity um, and to inject hopefully some positivity into um into sort of everyone's passion that we deal with, which is snow sports. And, and we pretty much had all, all around high levels of positive reactions to it. And yeah. um, had, had people been worried about whether they were gonna get a refund or told they weren't gonna get a refund, et cetera, et cetera. I think we would have had a lot more people putting negative comments on there and that would have worked um, you know, the opposite way to what, what we wanted it to work. 
yeah a lot of questions that we've been um we've been getting in is are people asking you know when should i post and what should i post and should i acknowledge the elephant in the room should we actually talk about what's going on and i think i think the main the main answer to that is is you know nail your customer service and once you you've really um you've really dealt with customers in the way that 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 you should be and really provided a positive experience then you can go on social media and, and shout about as, as as many things as you want and you can really lean on your your brand and all the other things that you stand for but i think until you've you've really dealt with that customer service in the right way um it's difficult to start posting on social media because people don't really know where they stand so it's a good point um and then looking forward to december which, which is when you said your um your next next season would be starting up. Um, do you think your um, your really uh, quick, honest and reactive approach will uh, improve your customer retention for the next season that starts up in December? Uh, bookings are starting to come in already. So that's obviously positive and really good um, for us in the in difficult times. Um, one slight concern is um, some of the customers, they might just feel that the way we've dealt with it as in quickly and efficiently is just the norm okay um, so you know unless they talk to friends and family that have had um you know uh, a less easy process with other companies they might assume wherever they go they're going to get this sort of service yeah so in some ways you do want to shout about that but um in you've got to remain sensitive to the industry um like mark said there's a number of companies that just can't refund um and, and this is completely unprecedented so um we just want those companies to make it through this as well and and, and not not fail essentially so in, in answer to the question i'm confident that we'll feel a benefit in the long term i think most customers will remember um the positive way we dealt with coronavirus that's great um thank you so much danny we are going to go into our final section now so we've got a quick q a um from everyone who signed up and submitted their questions to our panelists um so we've got our first question from lisa and it is uh, i'm going to direct this one to mark from high doubt so uh, how in your opinion can festivals turn customers into brand advocates especially in such a saturated festival market which makes it really hard for a customer to remain loyal uh, to a particular festival brand when there's there's so many popping up um, i think you just got to make the experience as best as possible for them um it's interesting that we're talking about this in how to do this for a festival that's not actually happening this year whereas normally the best way to be uh, get your customers into a, being a brand advocate is give them the best experience from start to finish possible from from the point of booking or the point of inquiring about the booking until um when they're on that flight back home again and they've had an amazing time i think just looking after your customer um Look, I think one of the key things is running a festival is not easy. Running trips abroad are not easy. Um, a lot of people don't understand the complexities of what goes on um, behind the scenes to doing this. But I feel like you've always got to treat your customer fairly. Um, if they don't understand something, I always find that you get a great response if you sit there and spend the time explaining why something's happened. Um, because people will sometimes make like an off the cuff remark, but if you come back to them in detail and go, actually, the reason we've done this is X, Y, Z, they go, all right, I didn't consider that. And then the fact that you've had that interaction and had them buy into things a little bit more and understand a bit more about your company and how you operate is, is a great way for them to then go away and go, oh, you know what? I spoke to someone from Hideout and the experience was really nice and very polite and I think it's just dealing with people and just giving them the best experience possible. Yeah, that's great. T totally agree. Uh, next question is from Matt. Uh, and this one is for Rashad from uh, Ticket Arena and Fest Ticket. So do you think that a festival's corporate social responsibility um, plays any part in customer ad advocacy and retention? And I think that the, the relevancy of this question right now is that if your, you know, if your, your operations can't happen right now, how can you actually take more of a social responsibility to help the community? And, you know, there's loads of amazing efforts going on right now um, to actually retain your customers and show that your, your company is doing more than just, um, you know, just, just selling your product or your service. Yeah, sure. I think a lot of people are, um, you know, with the brands, they've got access to a lot of talent and uh, a lot of content. And I think 
now looking at how can they leverage that content to you know to do shows online and and you know potentially like I said help the community or provide fundraisers and, and things like that basically I think um, obviously you know it, it keeps the customers engaged the brand so if the show was meant to be happening on a certain day you were seeing a lot of uh, festivals now doing virtual festivals and things like that and some of the proceeds get donated um, sometimes you know part of it might have to be they might also have to cover some of the operations but um, I think yeah I, th I think in general is trying to wait, raise awareness um, for for what's going on in the world at the moment and a lot of powerful content that they have they can do so mm. through, through, think, through our shows. yeah totally agree and I think it's really relevant for younger audiences with this as well because there's loads of data out there that shows millenn millennials and, and and gen z they're, they're very conscious of, of who they purchase from and and what the what the companies and the brands they follow what they're doing outside of of just their their usual operations so i think it's um you know it's backed up in, in the data that that is what a lot of the younger audiences are looking out for and and they, they are the audiences that are going to festivals and events a lot of the time so i think it's a, an important thing to, to look out for thanks reshad yeah. uh, we're going to our next question, which is from Caesar, um, and this one's for Danny from Nuco. Um, so Caesar's question is: How can you take advantage of social media to improve your customer service, especially during quarantine, and use that to really improve customer satisfaction and relationship? And I think this is a good question because um, maybe traditional uh, senses of customer service come through email and maybe phone calls, but what social media is granted is is the customer more access to the brand and the brand more access to the customer. So, um, how how would you think you could take advantage of that? I think in the, the current climate, companies with good customer service can enhance um, their customer relationships through socials. Mm. Um, companies with poor customer service, whether that's through social media or email, are going to struggle on socials as um, any comments and feedback are going to be, be negative. And we've used it as an opportunity to stay positive and think about um, everyone's passion or our shared passion. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've combined that with our existing customer service provision which has been positive and I think that's solidified um, our audience's opinion of Nuco. Um, I think hopefully more than ever they see it as a brand they can trust and hopefully one that they'll um, book future holidays with. Yeah great thanks Danny uh, and then we've got our last question from Camilla. Um, so this question is what advice would you give to organizations who currently aren't allowed to use their socials to talk about COVID-19. So I'm, I'm going to take this question. Um, thanks for sending that in. I think it's a, it's a really valid question and it's a good one that uh, is on a lot of people's minds right now. I'd actually say you don't want to be using your socials to talk about COVID-19. I think aside from the operational updates that, that you need to post out for customers, I'd be thinking how else can you use your social media to relate to your audience right now? How are they feeling? What do they want to see? Um, I think this, uh, Danny's just touched on actually this is the time to to lean back on your brand values and what your brand stands for because that is why that's why people go to your festival that's why people buy things from you that's why people follow you because they they align with you in some way so why why does your audience follow you and not your competitors and, and when you're posting on your feed what value are you are you bring to people who who follow you because if it's just throwback content all the time you know people are going to get pretty bored pretty quick but what can you actually align with people on that that's unique to your brand um, and then I guess that the COVID-19 situation, you know, it's not one to be ignored, but I think once you've you've dealt with your customer service and said the statements that, that need to be said around the situation, um, you know, can you join or, or start your own campaign that's doing good for the wider community? So you're relating to, to COVID-19, but in a, in a positive way where, where you can. Um, but I think that the main thing for me about social media is that it was, it was created for conversation. And I think what what you want to do with your social channels is create a dialogue, not a monologue. Because I think if you're just shouting at people and saying things and just pushing things out and not really inviting anything back, that's not, you know, social media is great. As I've, as I've just said, it kind of allows you so much access to your customers and vice versa. So how can you make, make the most out of that? Um, so, yeah, to kind of recap, I think it's best to address the customers um, who need to know the updates on your business and, and what's happening right now. But once that's done, really focus on, on creating a conversation with your audience and, and kind of don't be afraid to, um, to invite that on, on your channels. 
Uh, so that's all of our questions from from our Q and A for today. Um, so thanks to everyone who tuned in, and we've actually got um, a fun competition coming next week uh, for everyone who tunes in. So stay tuned, and we've got we've got something else to announce on that one. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, thank you for joining us. Uh, keep sending your questions. Join the Facebook group. We'll we'll be on that straight after here, sending links and seeing if anyone's get any more questions, and then get in touch on Instagram uh, at Business Keeps On Dancing. Feel free to, to drop me a message as well. My name's Sean Bennett. You can find me on on LinkedIn. Uh, and then businesskeepsondancing.com um, is where you can send the link to any of your friends or, or family or, or co-workers that you think would find um, this really valuable as well. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you next Thursday. Take care and we'll speak to you in the, the Facebook group later on.